you're welcome. Uh, the experiment is uh, properties of organic compounds. The difference between organic compounds and inorganic compounds is that organic compounds, they are made of mainly carbon and hydrogen. And there are some of those compounds, they have functional groups like with uh, involving oxygen or uh, nitrogen. And uh, if the compound is just a hydrocarbon, is carbon and hydrogen, because the electronegativity between carbon and hydrogen is very small, the difference in electronegativity is very low. So basically, tendency of accepting electron uh, for hydrogen and for carbon is the same. As a result, the bond that is forming between carbon and nitrogen, uh, carbon and uh, another carbon or carbon and hydrogen is nonpolar. So all organic molecules that they are made only of hydrocarbons that means they are formed they are basically made of carbon and hydrogen they are nonpolar compounds what does it mean is nonpolar uh, a compound is nonpolar because the because the electron distribution in the molecule is even is kind of symmetrical is uniform and there is no plus charge for one side of the molecule, negative side on the other side of the molecule. So your molecule is nonpolar. If the molecule is nonpolar, then it's going to have weaker intermolecular forces. Well, explaining all of this is not going to be like fun for you to listen, uh, but is very informative. The reason is not fun because it's early in the semester for your chapter and in, uh, for your lecture, and you may not have everything covered already. At the same time, I want to make sure that you understand why organic molecules, they have lower uh, melting point, boiling point, and organic molecules often, they do not dissolve in water because they are nonpolar. And the reason they are nonpolar, because of the electronegativity difference between carbon and hydrogen is very low between carbon and other carbon molecule is very low. Electron distribution is even, like uniform electron distribution. So there is no positive or negative charge. If you have a molecule that is polar, like water molecule is polar, you have hydrogens down here, you have two hydrogens, and then you have your uh, oxygen. You have pair of unshared electron here, pair of unshared electron here. Oxygens, is have a strong or higher electronegativity so it's going to pull the electrons from hydrogen this oxygen is going to pull electron from the other hydrogen so basically you get more electron on this side and less electron on this side of the molecule so you get more electron density so electron distribution is not even and since electron carries negative charge the side of the molecule that has more electron or electron density is higher is going to have partially negative charge and this side of the molecule is going to have with the less electro uh, with uh, le lower electron density is going to have partially positive charge so as a result this molecule is said to be is a polar molecule if the molecule is polar and then you have another molecule of water that is also polar and you have the hydrogens on this side and oxygen on this side. Now you have a negative charge here and positive charge on this end of the molecule because you align them opposite um, in opposite way. Now there would be electrostatic attraction here. Oxygen is going to be attracted to this hydrogen. And then this oxygen here is going to be attracted to the other hydrogen. So these molecules, they hold to one another stronger because they are polar molecule. And specifically for water molecule, it has like hydrogen bonding. That means it holds the, the, to the other molecule from via the intermolecular forces stronger. So if you have a molecule, if you have a container, let's say you have a beaker of water, and in order to boil this water, you have to apply heat. And when you apply heat to this water, the water molecule is going to go from liquid phase to gas phase. And in order for this molecule to go to the gas phase, 
you have to break the bond between this water molecule and adjacent water molecule that you have here. So if you have two water molecules, you have to break this bond, you have to break these bonds. The stronger these bonds are, you have to apply more heat. So you have to put the bonds burner or the heat for longer time, and you are going to increase the temperature. It requires higher temperature for it to boil. So the stronger these intermolecular forces are, higher the boiling point. For organic molecule, these intermolecular uh, forces are weak because there is no positive negative charge. So there is no electrostatic attraction or the electrostatic attraction that is between this molecule, organic molecule, and another mo organic molecule is going to be weaker. So if you want to try to heat it up, it doesn't take much to change to gas phase. Like methane, CH4 stays at, is, a, is gas at room temperature. It actually has a very low melting point. Um, so it boils at minus like 190, let's say. That's a very, very low number for methane to boil. So it's going to be gas at room temperature. Ethane, the same propane, the propane tank that you are using for grill is an organic molecule, but is gas at room temperature. So if you have a molecule, organic compounds, because they are non-polar, they have lower melting point, they have lower boiling point. The other physical property of the organic molecule that is affected, because of their intermolecular forces or because of the non-polar nature of these organic molecules, is solubility. What is solubility? Solubility is the, if in general, if we don't specify the solvent, it means solubility in water. And solubility in water, in general, or the Tom's rule, or general rule for solubility is like dissolves in like. What does it mean, like dissolves in like? It means that if your compound is polar, it would dissolve in polar solvent. So since we already know water is polar, if our compound is polar, it's dissolved in water. If it's not polar, it's not going to dissolve in water. So when you have like oil and vinegar, you shake it for a long time, you leave it at the table, oil would go up and, and water would go down. It's like oil and water. Yes, exactly. Oil and water also, they are immiscible, means they don't dissolve in one another because one is polar, which is water, and oil is non-polar. Now, since oil is non-polar, if you bring a solvent that is non-polar, like oil can dissolve in benzene, oil can dissolve in hexane or toluene or anything that is non-polar. So oil can dissolve in those non-polar compounds. So if you have like oil-based paint in your hand, then you can you can actually wash it with thinner because thinner also is uh, organic molecule. So water is not going to wash it off. You have to dissolve it with something that is non-polar, like a thinner, like any organic solvent that is like benzene, gasoline, something that is going to dissolve it first. Um, soap, it's special. You probably learn about soap later. Uh, it's going to have a very long tail of carbon, which is non-polar. And then you have a head for that molecule that is polar. So you have a polar head and non-polar tail. So when you, you're, you have oil in your hand and you use soap, the tail of soap, which is non-polar, is going to attach or dissolve the oil. The head of the soap molecule that is polar, it would dissolve in water. So soap molecule is going to act like a bridge. It would wash off the oil from your hand, and then you rinse it with water. So oil, uh, the molecule of soap is kind of acting as a, as a bridge. So what is melting point? Melting point is the temperature, which in that temperature, solid changes to liquid. Melting for organic molecules or organic compounds is relatively low compared to inorganic molecules. I give you one example. Let's say sodium chloride, which is not a very big molecule. Sodium chloride 
and that is table salt. Table salt dissolves uh, at, sorry, melts at 800 degrees Celsius. That is a very high number. Uh, so you have to increase the temperature to 800 degrees Celsius for it to dissolve. But molecule of octane or isooctane that you find in the in the gasoline or gas is liquid at room temperature. That means the melting point is way below room temperature. So melting point is like negative number because it's an organic uh, organic compound. So for the experiment today, first we are going to measure the melting point, and I'm going to show you the technique on how to measure the melting point. I mean the laptop, so it's more now movable. I can move it around. Um, the first compound that we are going to measure the melting point for, based on the report sheet, um, the data sheet, is naturally. So we are using a melt temp i show you here melt temp apparatus this is like a small machine that is used for measuring melting points for organic compounds it has a a uh, point here and on the surface of this plate you see a power regulator it goes from zero to ten and we can regulate how fast we want to heat the melt -time apparatus. There is a on-off switch on the, again, on the plate that you can see. There is a thermometer holder where it holds the thermometer right here. And there is a very small opening here that we will soon place the sample in. In order to place the sample in a melt -time apparatus, we are using a capillary tube. So capillary tube is a small, like a tiny test tube, very small. It has a closed end and an open end. So when I take the capillary tube, I only touch the, the closed end of the capillary tube because I want to dip this into, the, into my sample. And when you look at the sample, this sample is like the crystals are too large it's not going to fit into the to the capillary tube so what i'm going to do i'm going to take some of the sample and grind it using a mortar and pestle we're going to grind the sample why do we have to grind the sample because large crystals are not going to fit into the capillary tube and then I use the capillary tube. I dip into the sample a few times. I get some of the compound into the capillary tube, but it's all the way up here. And because it's all the way up, I'm going to pass it through a glass tube. It's a hollow glass tube. I pass it through this. The sample is going to go all the way down. I don't want to have any air bubbles in here. So I want to make sure that the packing is efficient and we get like a packed, packed sample here. We don't want air because if we have air here, air is going to um, prevent the even distribution of the heat. And then one part of the sample is going to be melting before the other part of the sample uh, sample melts. So what is the application of melting point? Why do we measure the melting point for any compound in the lab? Can anyone answer that? What is the application for melting point? Purity, perfect. We can determine the sample is pure or not if we measure the melting point. A pure sample can is going to melt with the sharp range of melting uh, very good purity and identity so pure sample is going to melt sharply that means from the time that you would see part of it dissolves until entire 
sample results is like two degrees Celsius, two to three degrees Celsius. Let's say if this compound starts melting at 78 and stops melting at 80, I have a pure sample. Or it starts melting at 79 and it stops melting at 82, I have a pure sample. But if this sample starts melting at 65 and then stops melting at 79 or 76, a, a wide range of melting, that indicates my compound is not pure. So that's how a compound can be determined if it's pure or not using melting point. So we are looking for sharp melting for pure sample. And if it's a wide range of melting, the sample is not pure. The other application would be the, the other application is for identity of the compound. If we have an unknown and our unknown melts at let's say 123, and then I look at the two or three known samples that we have, and if my known sample melts at uh, my benzoic acid sample melts at 122, and naphthalene melts at 80 degree, then what is my unknown? Which one of these two compounds matches the unknown? So if they tell me that your unknown is either naphthalene or benzoic acid, I measure the melting point for the uh, for the unknown. If it's close to the melting point for naphthalene, then it's naphthalene. If it's close to the melting point of benzoic acid, going to be uh, benzoic acid. I say it close because if there is any like error on the thermometer, if the thermometer is not calibrated, you may not get exact same number. But if the thermometer is calibrated and my sample is pure, we should get exact same number as the literature uh, value. So we can identify the compound using melting point, or we can determine if the sample is pure or not. Okay. Um, if you could take a screenshot of the setup now for the melting apparatus. Take the screenshot. You hold it. This is the, the apparatus. You could see, right? It's visible. A screenshot of the apparatus at this point. And you would use the screenshot to submit it to the same folder, assignment folder for the data sheet. Okay, I'm going to heat up. The melting point for this compound is 80 degrees. So based on this chart that I have here, based on this chart, I can determine this chart is telling me what should be the setting for the power regulator. If the compound is melting between 100 and 150, the setting should be between 4 and 5. If it's melting around 100, the setting should be between 3 and 4. So for 80 degree or anything between 50 and 100 is going to be at 3, no more than 4. So I'm going to use the, uh, I'm going to use the, um, Three setting for three or setting re for the for my rate of heating. So this is going to be set up at three because I want like slow heating at this one. And we monitor and check through this eyepiece until the sample is melted. Just keep in mind, if I'm talking to you or you're talking to your friends and you're doing this experiment, if your sample is melted, you miss the recording the exact number when it was melting. You take the sample, it's liquid. When you take it out, it's solid, right? When it's inside, it's liquid. When it's hot, you take it out, it's solid again. You cannot reuse that sample. For melting point of organic compound, you just you have to make the new sample again. You cannot reuse the sample because you heated up that sample. It can decompose the sample at high temperature because we don't know how high it was melted. So it can decompose the sample. We cannot use that sample. We have to make sure that the sample uh, we prepare fresh sample. 
and keep monitoring by checking for the melting point. So this way, you don't have to do the work a couple of times or again. The temperature is at 60 and has not melted yet. This compound that I'm using is naphthalene, and that is for the B, yes, for B experimental melting point range for naphthalene, I'm trying to find out. And while this one is melting, since I need to find the melting for unknown, I am going to get unknown sample for my um, for the melting point of the unknown. And I'm choosing letter C. You want to take a screenshot or you want to write down letter C? Either one is fine. I'm picking letter C for unknown. Okay. Letter C for unknown. For experiment A, yes, for melting point, I'm using letter C of unknown for the melting point. Yes, exactly. And while I'm waiting for the naphthalene to melt, I'm preparing my unknown. So for melting point, the unknown letter is a letter C. The experiment range it is not 50 to 100. That's just for setting of the uh, the 80 degree that is the uh, the actual melting point for naphthalene. It's uh, we already know that naphthalene should melt around 80. So based on this chart, if my compound melts anywhere between 50 and 100, I'm going to set up the power regulator which shows here this is the power regulator that shows here at three so i don't heat up too fast because if i put at 10 that's like you're putting too much gas in your you know uh, the you put too much pressure in the gas pedal and you just make it uh, your car move faster we don't want like fast experiment we want like gentle heating so the thermometer can actually show the actual temperature of the sample. If we heat it up too fast, if we heat it up too fast, okay, this is starting at 78. Please record it. 78. Okay, it went a little too high. So 78 and then it was going to 80, 82. Yes, the letter is C. The letter for the unknown is C. Okay, I'm going to take it quickly and show it to you. You know, you could see from the magnifying glass that this sample now is melted, and I'm going to take it out. And this is the melted sample. I take it out and I dispose this into a disposable glass box later on. And now I prepared my unknown sample C. I placed the unknown sample in the melter and turn it on. The temperature on the on the melting, it has to be on the thermometer. It should be less than the melting point of the sample. And if, like in this case, my unknown melted right away, that means the melting apparatus is too hot for this unknown. It melted right away. I'm going to have to wait until the temperature drops. It cools down like by 10, 20 degrees Celsius before I can use this. Unless I change my unknown and I get like a different unknown with a higher melting point. So the starting temperature for the unknown, for the melting or for thermometer, it should be at least 10 degrees less than 
melting point sample. Otherwise, as soon as I, I put it, it melts, and I don't know what was the melting point because it's too hot, it would melt right away. So this was not a good technique, or the, since it's unknown, I didn't know what is the melting point. So basically, I did like a quick melt because it was too hot. I took out the sample because it melted right away, not valid number. I'm leaving here to dispose later. Prepare a new sample. Going to prepare a new sample for unknown. And you can see that I don't know what's the name of the unknown yet, but I will look at it later. I prepare a new sample for the unknown and wait until the temperature drops. I'm going to wait until the temperature drops to 70 degrees. So in case this compound melts at like 80 or so, it doesn't melt right away because right now it's showing like 95. So I cannot place it in there yet. I'm going to keep my sample safe until the melting apparatus it cools down to 70 degrees. Why 70? Because this unknowns, the samples that I have, uh, they can be naphthalene with the 80 degree or it can be uh, baric acid with 123, the lowest one that I we have in the in uh, among the unknowns is 80 degree. So I'm going to wait until it's 70 degree before I start melting my sample. Okay, while I'm waiting for melt them to cool down, I'm going to prepare hot water bath because we are using boiling point for the sample for our um, experiment. For boiling point, I need hot water. So you know how we prepared the hot water bath the other day? Going to use a beaker. Okay, here's the beaker for the um, hot water bath. The equipments are inside the cabinet, so I'm going to get the stand for the, for the, to prepare my hot water bath. Okay, right here, actually. They were nice enough to leave it here for me. That's good. Can you see the setup or should I change the angle? You can see it? Okay. So, For boiling point, we are using boiling point, we're just using unknown for the boiling point. And to prepare for boiling point, have to I'm using a, a seal tube or a small test tube attached to the thermometer using rubber band here. Okay. Which unknown should I use? I'm not going to use C this time. I'm using unknown B for the liquid. OK. 
Okay, using unknown B for liquid. A dropper, I forgot to give me a dropper. For unknown B, to pour some into the beaker first because I don't want to contaminate the container or the liquid that I have in the container. I take about five drops of this unknown B, which I have in the beaker. Um, five drops of the unknown B, and I place into the small test tube. This compound, whatever it is, it has very low boiling point because it doesn't stay even in the dropper. We place the Kepler tube with open end down. This. The unknown is B for section B. Yes. For section B, the unknown is B. I place the capillar tube with open end down, and I'm going to start heating up the sample. What's going to happen when this sample starts boiling? When the sample starts boiling, it would change to gas. And since the end of the capillar tube is closed, the gas doesn't stay in this closed container. It, it needs to escape the container. And as it needs to escape the container, it's going to come out from the open end of the capillary tube. And when it's coming out of the capillary tube, you would see those bubbles. So when you see the bubbles are coming like one at a time and they are coming kind of fast, we are going to uh, read the temperature here and look at the, the, record that temperature as the boiling point for this sample. So at the temperature that this sample starts boiling, the, it would change to gas, and the gas in an open container is hard for you to see the gas. But for capillary tube, because it's closed, the open end of the capillary tube is all the way down here. The bubbles is going to come out, and when it comes out, it's easy to see inside the liquid. And I'm going to actually bring the camera close so you could see the closed caption of it, and you could also take the screenshot of that also for the boiling point or the setup for the boiling point. So I'm 100% sure that this compound is going to boil very quickly. So I'm going to have to cool down this water. I don't want the same thing as the, as the melting point. So I'm going to leave the sample inside the inside the water this sample whatever it is it must boil at less than 100 degrees otherwise it's not a good design of the experiment or a good unknown choice because this compound so uh, since our sample is water here for the water heat uh, for the water bath we are using water bath maximum temperature that we can get is 100 degrees celsius so, I'm going to add some cold water to make sure that it gives us enough time to read and record that number. Okay. The thermometer temperature is at 40 right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your responses. Yes, this is not 70 yet. That's why it, it just reached 70 right now. So I'm going to finish this experiment for boiling first, and then we go to the melting. It's good to take advantage of the time we have. So do you see this capillary tube now in here? And I'm going to hold it like this, close. So I want you to be able to see those bubbles. 
as soon as they come out. Now they are actually coming out. Do you see the bubbles? You see the bubbles coming out in the liquid form? See? As soon as they come out fast, I'm going to record that number. Okay. You see those bubbles? Please take a screenshot of this. Now you see the bubbles? I have the number for you. I, I already read the number. But you, I want you to see those bubbles coming out. That's how you record the uh, temperature. So take a screenshot of the setup, look at, observe the bubbles that are forming, and the temperature was 56. The temperature for boiling point was 56. Boiling point of the unknown is 56. So I am taking enough of the heat. I don't want it to boil the sample. If I, I'm going to get all the vapor in my face, there is no need to inhale more than what you really have to of these chemicals. Okay, I'm sorry for going back and forth, but it was perfect timing because now the temperature here is about 65, perfect for our sample. We can start the melting point of the unknown at this point. Melting point for the unknown, I place the sample. I turn on the melting point apparatus or the melt tank apparatus. Okay, you see. And wait until it is melted. So it's at 60 now. It dropped because it was off for long enough. It went down. Now it's going up. And as soon as it melts, I will show you. I'm trying to bring the camera close enough for you to see it. But if you don't see it, just trust me, I'm going to read the exact number, regardless if it's going to give some error or not. Every experiment has some experimental error. So it could be from me or you. The point is that we read and trust the numbers that we actually get from the experiment. And we take those numbers with some degree of error. But sometimes you get like exact number and it's not always with the error. Okay. So it's now the temperature is increasing. Okay. While we are waiting for this melting of the sample to take place, going to talk about solubility. The general rule for solubility is light dissolves in light. So polar compound would dissolve in polar solvent. Non-polar compound dissolves in non-polar uh, solvent. So sodium sulfate. Sodium sulfate is actually ionic compound. And ionic compounds, they are polar and they can um dissolve in water some of them they are soluble others are insoluble let me monitor this i don't want to get them okay it's very close because i see the sweating
Okay, it starts melting. The temperature is 75. It starts melting. So it is already 75. And it's finished melting 77. So at least it's short. 75 to 77. The melting was 70, started at 75 and it stopped at 77. Seventy-five to seventy-seven. Now we're going to turn off the heat. We are done with the melting experiment. We take this capillary tube out to dispose it into broken glass box. We are done with melting point and measuring boiling point. Last part of the experiment or part c of the experiment is solubility and solubility of the um, solid in liquid how do we know a compound is soluble to to uh, test if the compound is soluble or not we are going for solid in liquid it's very easy and obvious to recognize so what we do we take like a tip of a spatula of the compound of the uh, of the sample. We place it in the in a test tube. We add solvent, shake it. If the solid disappears completely, it's soluble, and your solution is clear. If the solid does not disappear completely and your solvent or solution gets cloudy. That can be classified as partially soluble, somewhat soluble, like partially soluble. If you add the solid and you add the salt and nothing happens, the solid stays there, your compound is not soluble in that solvent. So it would be not soluble. So you're going to test each one and record. It looks like we don't have any droppers here, so I need to ask for some droppers. Okay. Hopefully, it brings us droppers. Now, the first compound or the first mixture is sodium sulfate in water. Okay. First one is water. So I'm going to add about Three to five milliliters of water. Add sodium sulfate. Maybe I can use this with sticks. So I'm going to add sodium sulfate to, to water. Mix it well. I'm using a good stick for a spatula. Mix it well. Do you see any 
leftover of the solid compound. It did dissolve, yes. So since there is no more, no solid left, this compound of sodium sulfate, sodium sulfate is soluble in water. So the first one, sodium sulfate in water, you can record it as soluble, but please write that, uh, write that uh, you can, you, you don't see any solid left here. Second mixture is sodium sulfate in methylene chloride. So with methylene chloride, we cannot joke with those some of those chemicals. I cannot touch it. I have to make sure I'm going to use my gloves for that. Like the other one, the first one was water, so I do not. I guess nobody is afraid of it. You should assume all chemicals are. Dangerous, they are corrosive, not good to use unless you know otherwise. So next is going to be methylene chloride and sodium sulfate. Methylene chloride is an organic solvent. What do you expect? Do you think sodium sulfate would dissolve in methylene chloride or not? No, because for your organic molecule, for the non-polar or organic solvent, and then sodium sulfate is polar or ionic compound. It's ionic compound because it's a metal non-metal. Okay? The metal non-metal. For ionic compound, the, uh, they are considered highly polar and they don't dissolve in organic solvent. Okay. I add the um, sodium sulfate to methylene chloride, mix it, and test it. See? The solid still is there. Um, still is there. I can. The, the wood is good. It's better to fit into the test tube. So I'm using the wood pieces. It's insoluble because you could see the solid did not dissolve in the water. Okay. Next one: sodium sulfate in pentane. Pentane is also organic solvent. Pentane is made of only carbon and hydrogen. So it is nonpolar. And because it's nonpolar, it's expected to not dissolve actually. Sodium sulfate it should not dissolve in should not dissolve in pentane either. Okay. It's like sand and water. If the compound is not soluble, it would settle. You see the slide of the test tube? The compound stayed there and it did not dissolve. So this one, sodium sulfate in pentane did not dissolve. Next compound, I have water. And naphthalene. What do you expect? Should naphthalene dissolve in water or not? You could ask the question or answer. You can ask a question before you answer. No, 
No, naphthalene is not alcohol. Naphthalene is an organic molecule. It's made of carbon and hydrogen only. So a good question for you to ask is, is naphthalene polar or nonpolar? If you know that part, then you can answer the question more confident, with more confidence, right? And if I tell you naphthalene is not polar, then what? Would it dissolve or not? Would it be insoluble? Because naphthalene is non-polar. It doesn't even mix. If it stays, it kind of floats on top like oil. So naphthalene is insoluble in water because it's not polar. Next one would be naphthalene in methylene chloride. What do you expect? Naphthalene in methylene chloride. Soluble or not? Soluble. If you mix it in, uh, if they stay in water for longer time, if it's not soluble, it's not soluble. I mean, over a long time, and if you heat up the water, yes, solubility increases with the temperature. But what happens if you have oil? You add oil to water that is boiling when you are cooking, like pasta or you are cooking rice and you are you're just adding oil what happens with the hot boiling water still oil is going to float right it's not going to mix it's not going to dissolve in water there is no interaction between the molecules they don't speak the same language so they don't blend they don't mingle they don't mix oil is non-polar and and uh, water is polar so sometimes you get to bring those like dictionaries, like if, if the one is speaking one language and the other one is speaking other language, completely unrelated and it's hard to to get it uh, or or even guess, um, then you not have much of interaction. But if you bring like a dictionary, that is like you're bringing soap, then you can mix the oil and water together. But if you don't bring the agent, like soap, you cannot make the oil dissolve in water. You shake it for a long time, you leave it alone, it goes to a separate layer again. Okay, this one was naphthalene in methylene chloride, right? Naphthalene in methylene chloride. What do you think? Soluble, yes. And next one is naphthalene in, it would be naphthalene in pentane. I add a few crystals of naphthalene. Add the solid of naphthalene, naphthalene solid. And liquid, pentane. It also dissolves completely, so soluble. What is next? Solubility of liquid in another liquid. Methylene chloride in water. If liquid in another liquid is soluble, you would see one layer or one phase. If they are not soluble, just like oil and water, it would form like two separate layers. And we are going to look at the methylene chloride with water. So if I have methylene chloride in this test tube, I add water. Okay. 
what type of background you would need to see this, Ralph? You can take this as the next screenshot. You can take it as a screenshot. And I want to see if you can see this two layers. One short layer down here. That's one layer. And the top one. Methylene chloride has higher density than water, so methylene chloride would stay down and water would stay up. Do you see it better with the black background or you see it better with the white background? Which one is easier for you to see? With the white? Okay. With the white background, see the one layer down here and then another layer up here. So we have the two layers. Can you see? Put it away. Yes. So if I hold it up here, you might see there is a line there also. Okay. And please make sure that you have at least like three screenshots so far. If you don't have it, you could take up this one. Take a screenshot now. Perfect. Uh, ethanol and water. So what do you think of ethanol with water? Do you think it's soluble? Ethanol with water. We mix the ethanol with water. We add water to ethanol. Okay, that's ethanol and what? One layer or two layers? One layer, so it is soluble. Okay? Because you have one layer, it would be soluble. Containing water. Containing water. So I have pentane in the test tube. I'm adding water. Now, it would be very easy for you to see if you were in the lab, but there's like a line here, the top layer, bottom layer. Pentane has lower density and water has higher density. So the bottom layer is water, the top layer is pentane. And it didn't mix, it didn't dissolve. You have two layers. Okay. Describe a flame test. I'm not sure if I want to do flame test. But you insist let me see if we have What should I use?
and you need a lighter or matches to test that. I don't really do this experiment when I have the students here, just say we have a precursor combustion reaction. Well, you know, if it if it generates enough heat and smoke, it can activate the fire alarm. But if I take it to a fume hood and I try it with the small sample of the uh, alcohol, it might work. Okay. I'm take it to fume hood and show it to you there. Uh, it's just showing that organic compounds, they are combustible also. Thank you. Thank you so much. So is the combustion reaction of the organic compounds. So do you see this? Okay, that is the flame that is coming from the ethanol. So it's just asking you to, to describe that the blue flame of the um, burning of the methanol or the alcohol in general. And it's showing that organic compounds, they are combustible. Do you see that? Yes. Uh-huh. Yes, it is. Yes, I tried to use a little bit of alcohol, but it looks like I put too much. So we just leave it there to finish. Right? That's it. Okay. That's the end of the experiments for today. That was the last part of the experiment. And at this point, I'm going to stop the recording because I need to call for attendance. And also, I answer your questions. Do you have any questions regarding this experiment before I stop the recording? No questions for this experiment? No? Okay. Nice. Okay. So if you don't have any questions for the experiment, because I prefer the questions on the um, the questions that you have regarding this experiment to be on the recording. The questions on the final like, uh, how would you know if compound is pure or not using melting point? Or a question like, if the compound A has a melting point of, let's say, 100 to 115, and compound B has the melting point of 80 to 83, which one is more pure? Questions like that. Um, if your compound uh, doesn't dissolve in water, what does it mean? So it means that your compound is not uh, polar, right? So these are some of the questions. Or would you expect pentane to dissolve in water? Uh, boiling point does not mean pure substance. Uh, is not the low boiling point or high boiling point, is the sharp boiling point. Yes, sharp boiling point also means that it's, uh, it's pure. With the with the hot point, and we didn't wait until the boiling point actually um, stops or everything is is boiled. So MP stands for melting point. Yes. 
the small range of melting or small range of boiling, both of them indicates that your sample is pure. If you have wide range for uh, boiling, that means from the time your compound starts boiling until everything has changed to gas. You monitor the temperature to see if it's going to change or not. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, a small range shows purity, more pure sample. High or low temperatures, it's, it depends on the nature of the compound. If you have high temperature for melting, like high melting point, it means that compound is uh, strongly bonded together. Most likely your compound is polar or your compound is ionic. A low melting point means your compound is like organic molecule with weak intermolecular forces. Your compound is not polar, like a non-polar compound. It's just the range that it counts. OK. I am going to, any other questions before I stop the recording? No? Okay. Going to stop the recording. I call for attendance and then we look at your data sheet and answer your questions.